Welcome to the Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions. The, the Mitchell Center has been giving out award, awards like this for nearly a decade. Ordinarily, we would do that at the end of the year. We have a holiday celebration in December, but I don't know about you guys. Uh, we haven't been doing things quite the way we used to during the pandemic. So we didn't do it then, but we thought it would be fun to kick off the spring semester by recognizing these amazing achievements. We've also asked the people who are re receiving these awards to say something about their work and what it means to them and what they're trying to get done. So it should be a fun mix. And uh, for those of you who aren't getting recognized today, let's hope that in a future award celebration, it's you who are, will be up here talking about important things you're doing. That's what we're trying to do is grow this community of people who are working together to change the world, starting right here. So we have four, oh, by the way, there was, uh, I'm very grateful to the uh, people who made nominations. There were way more great nominations of students and faculty and partners than could be recognized. And rather than me be the, the decider on that, we had a review committee who's been doing this for a long time. And they looked at all of these and they said they really struggled because the reviews were so strong, but they did make a decision. And so um, I'll be, uh, naming the award recipients, some of whom are here in person. I'm glad about that. Some of whom will be here virtually, some who couldn't make it today, including one who's uh, got COVID. So there you go. Um, I won't be surprised if I get a little mixed up. Usually we do this in person. It's a little clearer about who's coming and going. I might not have even met some of you yet, but I'm thrilled that you're here and uh, I, um, uh, let me just get this off the ground. So the four different awards, the first one is for a team, a team effort. Uh, it is the food waste student team that was working with Suzanne Lee, who I've been in touch with many times in the last week, including this morning, uh, a wonderful faculty member uh, and member of the Mitchell Center. The team, and I'm going to mention all of them, although this is a good uh, example. Actually, this is maybe the only one where some people are here in person, some are virtual, and some can't make it. So um, maybe just so I'm pretty sure I know what I'm doing here, for the people that are in the room, just raise your hand when I get there, but I think I know who you are. Um, so Hannah Creighton uh, from Thomas College. By the way, this isn't just the University of Maine for this team, which is another cool thing. William Dunham from UMaine, uh, Ryan Fitzmorris, good to have you, Ryan. Uh, Ellie Hunt, who's virtual, I think. Kalina Kenyon, who, yeah, of course, thank you. <laughs> uh, Hannah Matthew, who I think can't be here today. Um, I think Melissa Veach from University of Maine Farmington is here virtually, and Ariana Walker, uh, I don't think can make it from the University of New England. So that's the team. And what I'm going to do is for the three of you that are here, I'm going to give you your awards. Uh, Suzanne is later going to follow up with you for the giant prize your whole team is going to get. Don't get too excited, but trust me, it's going to be great. Um, so why don't the three of you come up? And I know you're also planning to talk. But let me just do this. So, William. Thank you. And Ryan, thank you very much. Maybe I'll do this. Oh, oh no, 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 we don't do that anymore, huh? Never mind. How about there? I'm still learning how to do this. I've been staying home the last five years. So, take it away, right? You guys know what to do up here? Oh, I get yeah. out of your way, right? Hi, sorry about that. Um, so we are Food Rescue Maine, and today we will be sharing why we have received the outstanding contribution towards the development of a solution by a Food Research Team Award. So um, we have a huge food waste issue in the, in the United States with 40% of food waste in the US being wasted, while at the same time, one and five children and one and eight adults are food insecure. 
is a challenging issue, but we also have to make our food waste solution a sustainable solution that heeds the triple bottom line, which makes this food waste problem even more difficult to solve. So everything that we do here on the food waste project, we make sure that it meets the triple bottom line and that it that in that it benefits the planet, it benefits communities, and it benefits um, for a profit as well for the economy. Um, so to do this, we plan to reduce wasted food in Maine by 4% in 12 to 24 months on track to achieve 50% by 2030, to increase education about food waste issues and solutions through our pilots, and to increase participation in food waste solutions through reduction, recovery, and recycling also through our pilots. To introduce myself, my name is Hannah Creighton. I'm a student at Thomas College and I work primarily on Solution 6. I'm Kalina Kinian. I am a student at uh, UMaine and I work on Solution 3. I'm William Dunham. I'm also a student at the University of Maine and I work on Solution 4. I'm Melissa Beach. I'm a student at UMF and I also work on Solution 4. My name is Ellie Hunt. I'm a student at UMaine and I work on Solution 6. We also have two team members who couldn't be with us today, Ariana Walker, who's a student at UNE and works on Solution 2, and Hannah, Hannah Matthew, who is a student at UMaine and works on Solution 3. Um, so regarding our solutions, this network of interdisciplinary interns works together on six very different solutions to address the same problem. So Solution 1 focuses on tracking and measuring. Solution 2 works towards food recipe through software. Um, solution three is the communication and educational awareness team. Solution four works towards rebuilding food infrastructure processes. Solution five is our toolkit and um, food donation site. And solution six works toward landfill diversion. So most of the work we do is interdisciplinary. As you can see from this, uh, solution three outreach it works with us the most but we also discuss problems between the different solutions to make sure that when we can help each other, we do. And over the two years that we've been active, Food Rescue Maine has already worked with a large number of stakeholders, as well as students from different uh, educational backgrounds, as you can see up here. For solution one, I worked with the Maine Department of Corrections to measure their food waste within the Maine Women's Reentry Center down in Wyndham, Maine. And using estimates based on this data, I estimated the cost of the Department of Corrections of food waste, as well as identified the types of food that generated the most waste. And with their permission and help from numerous sources, I'm now tracking the food waste at Maine State Prison, as well as the Boulder Correctional Facility, and plan to do a similar analysis of their data. A uh, student for solution two, unfortunately, couldn't hear, be here today, but I'll summarize some of her accomplishments. Uh, there was a pilot program launched in the York County area, which enacted the Food Rescue Maine system in the community, and that allowed for donation sites and volunteers to create a circular food donation system. And here are some of the data collected, including 175 meals rescued by eight active volunteers over the months of November and December, which is approximately 270 pounds of food that otherwise would have been going to the landfill. Um, so for solution three, we have um, a Food Rescue Maine website and education materials. So the Food Rescue Maine website um, acts as a hub for all of the work that we do in this program. This is our main source of education for Maine's general public. Here we update our audience about food waste issues throughout our blog, news feed, and social media presence. The website will also be soon home to our education curriculum which includes a curriculum for both K through five and nine through 12th graders. While our elementary school program um, is finished and being used at the Gerald E. Talbot Community School, our high school curriculum is still being developed. Um, and in regards to our social media, uh, we, our so social media page is able to attract a wide variety of audiences that reach outside of Maine alone. By including different aspects of each six solutions, um, the social media pages are able to keep viewers up to date with the content and media that Food Rescue Maine puts out. So solution four is all about building Maine's food processing infrastructure. Uh, so for me, that means working with Maine farmers to find a productive use for the agricultural surplus. So the first step in that 
was a survey, which is up on the slide, uh, just some, you know, a quick survey that gave some preliminary answers to questions such as how much surplus is there? What are the crops that make up that surplus? Uh, what are the causes of that surplus? And then also what would farmers like to do with that surplus? And then we also are putting together another survey, which will be going out tomorrow to farmers if everything goes according to plan, uh, which is a little bit shorter. Uh, and the hope is that more farmers will be able to respond to that so we get some more robust data. Uh, and then we also have a great relationship with the DOC uh, where we're trying to work with them to sell them directly the raw surplus from farmers uh, and also exploring some processing solutions. And another part of this solution is we are trying to create this resource map um, that is easily accessible for Maine's public people to really kind of start to understand the food processing infrastructure and like this food system and help them visualize it. We also want it to help uh, create relationships between consumers, farmers, and stores. And this visual is just kind of some of the data we have collected so far. And we really hope it can be used to help people locate local food opportunities. And interestingly, uh, UMaine Class has taken this over. So it's really cool to see where they will take this. So solution five centers around food donations. Uh, so food donation is listed at number two on the main food recovery hierarchy, meaning that you should donate any surplus food that you may have before even feeding it to animals or composting it. And businesses such as restaurants and small grocers account for most of the preventable food waste created. So during my time here at the Mitchell Center, I've also created the Maine's Food Donation Toolkit, which is a step-by-step -step guide that businesses can use to start donating their excess food. And this toolkit addresses tax incentives, liability laws, how to interpret use by sell-by dates, and what food can be donated. And food pantries and community fridges can also accept donated food from households and individuals. So please be sure to check out our new home food donation guide coming to our website soon. So in solution six, we've been working with four pilot communities in Maine throughout their process of adopting food waste diversion programs. The town of Reedfield is using a community compost method. The towns of Winslow and Waterville are using community collection programs through AgriCycle, and Portland is using a community drop-off system through We Compost It. So my role was to track the success of the different campaigns and the community engagement that which Hannah works on. Through a series of metrics, uh, we look at participation percentage, the weight of food waste recycled, the savings generated, and the food donations to a local food pantry in each town. Going forward, we hope to continue working with our pilot communities and also work with the communities with current and newly developing food waste diversion programs in Maine in order to extend the beneficial impact of landfill diversion across the state. On the community engagement side of things, I've been working with each of these towns to develop education and awareness materials aimed at increasing food recycling participation rates. Each town varies slightly in the materials that they've chosen, but over the course of this last semester, I've created community posters, uh, a year-long social media postings guide, which advertises the collection sites and provides more information, informational brochures, a checklist of how to reduce food waste at home, and I currently have the home food donation guide in the works. I hope to expand the range and the outreach we have with these materials moving forward this spring semester. To answer the question of how we see our work making a difference, we, Food Rescue Maine follows the triple bottom line solution which impacts lives of Maine residents by focusing on community, the environment and economics. And through that, we're, we can make a difference uh, by reducing food waste across the state. And through our different solutions, we have also identified this. Like solution one uh, has identified over $500,000 worth of annual food waste in the DOC. And then our map also allows the public to visualize the food system and understand where these solutions can be created. And along the way, we have built relationships with stakeholders that uh, Ryan talked about. And in terms of how we've been changed by the experience of doing this work, I got some insight into the difficulty of collecting data rather than just analyzing it from a distance as I would typically do in schoolwork. 
Um, and then Hannah Matthew and myself have gone on multiple food rescues, which has not only impacted the community, but changed our views and mindsets on how to give food a new life. All right, so how can you join us in this work? So number one would be to use a home tracker. Uh, it's a food waste tracker put together by Ryan in Solution One. Uh, number two would be using Food Rescue US, uh, which is a platform that helps you volunteer uh, and pick up food at different locations and bring it to locations that need it. Uh, also supporting your farmers by buying local produce, so things like farmers markets, uh, but also gleaning, uh, which is a volunteer opportunity as well, which you know not a lot of people know about, but it's a great way to support farmers. Also composting. Uh, and if you already compost, it's always great to have community advocates who are pushing for broader community-wide composting projects. Uh, and then as well, if you're a student, uh, we're always accepting applications. There's no guarantee that at any one time we'll be looking to add to the team, but it is a, always great to have those resumes. Uh, and finally, we just wanna thank everybody who came here today, everybody on Zoom, all of our stakeholders, Suzanne as well for helping us through every part of this process. Uh, and also the Mitchell Center for having us here uh, and recognizing us with this work. So a few more things about that before I forget. If you haven't been to the Food Rescue Maine website yet, go there. It's totally cool. Um, it... uh, second, um, the the second food waste summit, one took place last spring, is happening on April 15th. Last time it happened, uh, Congresswoman Shelley Pingree spoke, uh, including about the students and the faculty and the university's role. Uh, so did Commissioner Melanie Loisem, who's a humane product and uh, has been at this podium before speaking about the uh, important work at DEP. So, that's a great place to go find out more. That'll be a wonderful gathering. The second award is for an outstanding student contribution to sustainability research. Uh, the award goes to Dominique Despirito and um, she was part of some food waste work before she started this new project. Uh, she'll tell you about it, but it's wonderful that Kate Ruskin nominated her and again, the review committee for these awards was really amazed by the great work. So please come up, Dominique. This is for you and don't lose the thing on the back. Okay, I'll get out of your way. Well, don't trip on that bag. Let me get set up here. Hello, everybody. <laughs> My name is Dominique Despirito. I'm a fourth year undergraduate student here in political science and honors. Um, and this is actually work I've been doing for two and a half years. Um, I got um, put onto the project by Dr. Kate Ruskin um, in August of 2019. So I've had the privilege of being with this project since we were starting survey design and all the way to submitting an article for publication. So it's been really formative work and I'm really happy to talk to you about it. <laughs> so this project, uh, I should have, let me backtrack, sorry. The project is about stakeholder groups uh, and how they exhibit varying preferences for freshwater resource management in Acadia National Park. Very important point, I should not have skipped. Um, why we decided to, why the project kind of came about is um, we're experiencing increasing usage of protected lands, especially in Acadia National Park. As some of you are probably familiar with, this picture shows the overcrowding in, on Cadillac Mountain, um, which before they instituted their uh, transportation management plan and the reservation system definitely led to people parking in areas that they shouldn't and um, general effects of overcrowding that have serious environmental consequences. Um, and it also kind of heightens our need to make sure that stakeholders are aware of the ecosystems around them and how to leave no trace in those, those helpful practices. We're also experiencing shifting baselines. Uh, we 
kind of don't know what we, we know. Um, and we don't know how climate change is going to affect these natural resources into the future, which can really drastically change how stakeholders perceive protected lands, is that beautiful view of Cadillac might look completely different in five or 10 years. Um, and we're also experiencing um, a stakeholder base that's shifting and um, displaying more diverse needs and interests. So getting um, an understanding and a snapshot of what those stakeholders look like is super important to guide management decisions. So how did we even uh, look at that? <laughs> um, well, we did that through intercept surveys. And as you can imagine, handing a clipboard to somebody kind of didn't work during COVID. Um, but before COVID, we visited a couple events that were targeting our stakeholder groups, the four main ones being visitors and uh, MDI residents, and then natural resource managers and environmental stewards. So some of those events might be at Scudig Institute or just visiting the park um, and handing over a clipboard or an iPad for them to take a brief survey. We had to get really, really creative um, once COVID hit though. Um, and how we did that is by putting that graphic on a sandwich board and having a couple of really dedicated volunteers move the sandwich board around the park a couple of times a week. Um, and people would scan the QR code, take the survey and we'd get our results. Uh, we also worked with um, libraries. Um, I have a fondness for public libraries. And so I reached out to libraries on the island and worked with them to get it in their newsletters and in their, um, like in their physical spaces and social media and also the Downey's chapter of Trout Unlimited to target, really target our local residents and make sure that they were still being represented in the sample. And then probably most importantly, we asked questions about how Acadia National Park's freshwater resources should be used in a couple different ways. Now, obviously we did more than I have time to talk about, but I'll highlight the three questions that we used in our article to really pull out how this data most impacts management decisions. So the first one, we asked uh, respondents to indicate their agreement level with 10 management goals. I'm not gonna read out every single one to you and I apologize if you can't see them, but generally um, we grouped these sort of into like ecological goals. So keeping ecosystems intact and undisturbed and then human facing goals like supporting the tourism industry and um, increasing recreation. This version of the question went to 50% of respondents and they were indicating support based on a Likert scale from um, strongly disagree to strongly agree with the neutral value. And um, then we asked the other 50% to prioritize those same management goals. So this was getting, trying to get at the difference between how we generally support something and where the rubber meets the road in terms of actually having to make trade-off decisions. So again, we use the same management goals, ask people to rank them from one to 10, one being the highest and 10 being the lowest. And then last but not least, this one was a really practical one. We gave them five activities and asked them what their restriction level preference was. If they preferred the activity be open, limited, prohibited. And this was trying to parse out information and management gaps between what the actual restrictions on MDI were um, in Acadia National Park and what stakeholders wanted or perceived should was the right enforcement to happen. So what did we learn? Um, despite having to pivot, we collected 589 surveys, which is pretty ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and those surveys represented our seven stakeholder groups really well in terms of proportions. What we also found is that there was general support with that Likert question I showed you for ecological management goals across all groups. Um, so there was some consensus, slight deviations between how much we supported them, but generally all of the value points were in the agree to strongly agree range. We also found the information gaps are present, which I will talk about an example in a moment. We also found that uh, respondents' preferences vary depending on the context. So the difference between that support and that prioritization question actually did manifest that there's a difference between the two. 
in terms of how people prefer um, management. And then perhaps the most significant and definitely the main thrust of our paper was that once can, we controlled for age, gender, and education, stakeholder group identity uh, was the strongest and um, was the strongest influencer of preferences and did so in a unique way. So preference uh, decisions that were affected by age and gender might not have been affected by stakeholder group identity and then stakeholder group identity affected other ones in different ways. And it was really cool to see that play out once controlling for those single variables. And it, it's kind of intuitive. We assume we consult stakeholders for a lot of things and we assume that different relationships with an issue yield different preferences and perspectives, but to see that actually manifest empirically was pretty novel. So for an example, we found that both visitors and MDI residents preferred less restrictions on swimming in Acadia National Park, particularly local residents preferred uh, less restrictions on swimming than visitors did. And this stands in stark contrast, contrast with the actual regulations. So some of you may have seen a sign like this, um, but six out of seven of the freshwater lakes within Acadia National Park prohibit swimming because they are public drinking supplies. So the fact that a large majority of um, visitors and MDI residents indicated that they wanted even very close to open, right? Like very, like no restrictions on swimming at all is, a real potential issue that management um, should consider either by increasing education or working with uh, water districts to negotiate those regulations. And then this graph shows that stakeholder perspectives are nuanced. So on the y-axis, you can see the average Likert response and the general, uh, general support, right? Um, and on the x-axis, you can see where they ranked them. So what's really cool about this is that it kind of gives management some marching orders. So for example, um, with tourism, we can see that generally people agreed that supporting tourism should be a, a management goal. But across the sample, it was ranked like 9.6 <laughs> out of 10. Um, so when it actually came to trade-off decisions, the sample almost unanimously agreed that tourism was like the lowest priority. And then you can also look at these three points, which are, have similar levels of support in terms of how people think they should be um, like general support, right? Um, but they're ranked drastically differently, uh, drastically different, there we go. Um, for example, wildlife was ranked among the highest priority of all of the 10 management goals. Drinking water was ranked kind of middle of the road and research was ranked lower priority. So this kind of, again, gives management some marching orders and thinking about, I generally care about wildlife or I generally care about tourism, but in resource constrained environments that management has to work in, like how many personnel I do I have? How much time do I have to devote to this issue? This gives some guidance of where the priorities are and can help make those decisions. So last but not least, um, I've been working on this project for two and a half years. Um, that is most of my undergraduate career. Um, and it's really shaped my relationship with research, right? Um, I'm, I have the privilege of having a first research experience that needed drastic pivots, <laughs> that needed, oh my gosh, why is R so hard to learn? Um, <laughs> and a learning experience. And that really carried into all of my other research experiences and honestly, all of my other like academic experiences that um, research in how we learn and how we approach the world grows with us. And that's something that I definitely carried into my thesis work and into my food-based solutions work. Um, and hope to carry further on. So now that I'm sort of maybe done talking like a squirrel, um, stay tuned for our article, which is in review in Ecology and Society. Um, and the title is Stakeholder Groups Exhibit Varying Preferences for Re Freshwater Resource Management in Acadia National Park.
And that is all I have for you. So one of the things that's exciting to see here in the Mitchell Center and across the university and many universities is the way that these experiences, really important experiences that students have go on to shape how they go out into the world and uh, play important leadership roles or engage citizens. Um, so we see them at one stage, uh, but we also see students who've gone out into the world and have been functioning in important leadership roles for decades. And our next award's going to somebody like that. So uh, the next category of award is for an outstanding contribution by an external partner to sustainability research. And this is also related to some of the work on food systems that's been going on for quite a while. Uh, this award goes to Mark King uh, from Maine DEP. Mark was an undergraduate here, weren't you, Mark? Oh, okay, Farmington, great, that's really good. And so again, here you have someone who got trained as an undergraduate, then went off and has been playing really important leadership roles. And I can say personally and, and kind of more generally that having partners that help us figure out what are the problems, how can we work together, how can we plug students into this work makes a huge difference both to create the kind of opportunities that students have maybe on good days to actually create the workforce of the future. I just spoke with Commissioner Loisum about this and they're very interested in having students do internships with DEP because they're looking for the leaders like Mark. And so I'm delighted that you're here, Mark. I'm glad you came and thank you so much for your great work. Well, thank you all for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And I have to say at the outset, I've been a very fortunate young man. Uh, when I joined the department 28 years ago, I never realized how much it would, would take me in, in the directions that I would go. And I've, I've had the greatest support from all of my agency partners and especially Paula Clark, who's been my supervisor uh, for a very long time. And she's a great mentor and has allowed me to do a lot of wonderful things. So going forward, the first thing I want to talk about is, is a little bit what's out there. We've already discussed it that, you know, 24 to 48% or 40% of the food is wasted and it's food that's available to go to positive use as opposed to going to landfill. I've spent my career kind of working towards the upside down pyramid over there, trying to help people not produce waste in the first place when we could giving it to people that were hungry and, and less fortunate. Uh, feeding animals, and then composting or digestion. There are still other options. We have waste to energy and landfilling, but those are not preferred. We like, to, we like to move towards the higher and better uses whenever we can. So in order to understand the problem, you've got to understand the barriers because that really leads us to, to, trying, to trying to solve things. And the first is really there's general apathy. People don't really put a value on waste until it costs them something. A lot of programs such as pay as you throw, bring that to the focus. Sometimes they're irritating to folks, but at the same time, they make us start to realize that this is more of a resource than a waste product. Some of the issues, the next three all are about infrastructure in the state. We have a lack of good storage or utilization capacity for food scraps. But when they're converted into things like compost or digestate, then they have a more available use for farms and, and other types of activities. Our infrastructure for collection is really poorly developed, but it's getting better and better and better. And uh, one of the things that's helped me a lot is my partnership with the Mitchell Center in coming up with creative solutions for communities to collect food and get it in a concentrated form where it can then go to a higher and better use. So that's been really positive. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then the limited uh, suitable sites and siting difficulties. We wanna set up organic collection and composting areas, but a lot of times the use of these materials, they tend to be trustable, they tend to be smelly, they tend to attract animals. So the public opposition 
tends to be one of our challenges that we have to sort of sort through. But the, the, the biggest one is basically the perception of cost compared with disposal. People feel that if they don't have to pay for it, then it doesn't really, it's not on their radar screen. And a lot of communities where I've tried to set up some really good composting collection operations, it's very challenging for me because all of their waste is subsidized. And so it makes it challenging, but not impossible. You just have to be more creative in how you approach it. So really the, the four major ways that I've sort of developed over the last uh, 20 years or so to, to eliminate these barriers. The first is to give lots and lots of education, make people aware of the value of food and the, the problem with our local soils and how they need nutrients to, to bring them back to health and fertility. So I try to give lots and lots of education. I also use the food recovery hierarchy. One of the things that I'd like to do before I retire is, is get more hot food to people that really need it as opposed to seeing it thrown away. Some of these buffets, when they're done, they toss it all in the garbage. I'd like to get that to hungry people if I can. So that's gonna be kind of one of my goals. But the really big thing is develop strong partnerships. And that's what I've done with the Mitchell Center, what I've done with students over the years. And the idea to developing a strong partnership is first affixing yourself to like-minded people and creating a series of goals that you all wanna reach and then each person picking up their piece of that goal in order to reach an achievement. And then finally, always delivering what you promise you're gonna do. There's nothing worse than taking off a bite bigger than you can chew and then not delivering. So it's better to just say, I can only do this and do it 100% than not at all. So that's really kind of my, my takeaway from, from partnerships. Also, we wanna invest in enhanced infrastructure. One of the coolest things that we've done at the department is we took over the Waste Diversion Grants Program, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but what it's, it's allowed us to, to invest money into the state's future in ways that are gonna drive us towards the goal of getting food scraps out of our landfills. And so that's been really comforting and really exciting to me. And then another big one is in order to get generators and haulers and other people interested, you better provide them provide incentives. And one of the best ways to do that when you go to a community is you say, we're going to save money for you by reducing the amount of money you spend on waste disposal. And that isn't always something that they like to hear or they can wrap their head around. They sometimes feel like I'm trying to sell ice cubes to Eskimos. But the deal is that if you look in the long run, we do save money. It may not be an immediate benefit, but down the road, it's a measurable benefit. And that's really important. I'm a big fan of pay as you throw. People don't like it because it's extra money when they've already paying taxes, but it's the quickest way to put a microscope on top of the issue. People start realizing, wow, I'm throwing away all this stuff. We get it moved in another direction. They buy less bags, they save money. So it's, it's really kind of a quick way to get there. But then also grants help us to develop these demonstration projects, which are also quite exciting. So this I put together to kind of show, I've been with the department for 28 years, but it really wasn't until 2004 that we really started focusing heavy on organics and organics management. And that was, we held a summit at Bates College. And that summit had people from all over the state of Maine, from all walks of life, from private citizens, to haulers, to producers, to farmers. And we all just talked about the problem. And it was a great chance to really understand where everybody had a little stake in the game. And, and it was quite a, quite a challenging thing, but we learned a lot from it. And then in 2005, we developed the first pilot program with, with a state planning office, waste diversion grant funds. And that was in the University of Maine at Farmington in the town of Farmington. And it was exciting because I sat down with a gentleman at Java Joe's in Farmington and we designed the whole facility on a napkin. And it still operates today. And it's one of the only operations where it's completely paid for by the amount of compost we sell. So it's 100% sustainable. And then uh, we did the waste stream study that was actually, I believe, 2011 to 2012, Travis and uh, Dr. Kreiner. Uh, and then 2014, we did some food scrap uh, collection workshops across the state. 
uh, 2016, we adopted our food recovery hierarchy, which I showed you at the beginning. Uh, 2017, we actually had some legislative action that developed some pilot projects. Uh, 2018, we did our very first waste diversion, diversion grant program. And then 2020, 21, and going forward, I established partnerships with the Mitchell Center. And I'm looking forward to the wonderful things that will come out of that. So this is just a few quick slides to show some things we've done. These are a couple of guides that I built for helping to move organics in the right direction. Uh, these are, are available on our website. This is a really great slide of the Waste Diversion Grant Program. We've dispersed since 2018 about $704,000. And those have all gone to help start programs. And if you look at the bottom, roughly 63% have gone to organics recovery programs of all the grants that we've dispersed. So it's really exciting to see the focus go to the food scrap recovery. This is what I hope to achieve this year. I'm going to be working with the Mitchell Center, Suzanne and Travis, and we are going to do workshops all across the state to try and raise awareness and attention towards the collection of organics in mass. And then we'll start looking at solutions of where they can go. So it'll be very, very exciting. So uh, final thought wise, best thing to do is to shop smart, have a sharp pencil and just not create waste in the first place. But when that can't happen, then we follow all the other steps. We try to get it to hungry people, hungry animals, compost, digest, and then we start moving towards disposal. You definitely wanna have solid partnerships and I believe the greatest partnership you can develop is with students. Students have fresh perspectives, they're, they're diligent, they're idealistic, they don't have a lot of biases, and they bring nothing but solid, pure research, and it's really a great relationship to have. And then, I, uh, this is something that I didn't always believe, but I do strongly now, you've got to have measurable metrics because you've got to know what you've achieved so that you can reproduce it. And that pretty much is all I had to say. Thank you. Mark reminded me um, that not just Suzanne Lee, who's been so important for this work, but we have Travis Blackmere here, here who was in the, on the ground floor of a lot of this work, even for his master's degree and continues to be uh, a huge leader and, and a resource for students and faculty and partners. So it's really great. Um, we got one more of these and um, the next award, the category is Outstanding Mentorship of a Student in Sustainability Research. Um, I happen, this was an award, a nomination that came from two separate students. And when I read both of those, I was just so impressed with what they had to say. I wasn't surprised because I knew who they were writing about, but this award goes to Sharon Klein. Just sit there for a second, Sharon, because I'm gonna say a few more things about you. So, uh, <laughs> So if you haven't met Sharon yet, and by the way, Travis is in the School of Economics as is Sharon and as is Mario Teisel, who's wandering around in the middle of things, uh, which is just fine. Um, but um, Sharon uh, has a really fascinating set of training, partly her PhD and what, what I think is now this bringing together of something that she would call interdisciplinary energy researcher. Um, but some of the work that she's doing, uh, both the work that she's done on things like community solar, but also work on energy efficiency. And the way you can tell uh, how important this is, is that my house is full of window inserts now, huge ones. And this is the warm up uh, where she's on the board, I think still of window dressers. Uh, and they did a community build right in this room. I did mine down in Orono, but a uh, really important kind of grassroots effort to build capacity to solve, you know, a different set of problems, but all of these kind of problems are connected, including the fact that food waste is one of the reasons we have methane in the atmosphere that's exacerbating the climate problem, right? So this is where these connections really matter. But so, A, thank you for introducing me to window inserts. I love them. Uh, and I think when... Uh, when Sharon comes up, you'll see that there's 
still a lot of really important work to do. And she is doing a great job of reaching out to communities that aren't always the ones that are the first to have the opportunity to work together in these partnerships. So I'll let her come up. I will hand to you something. Don't lose the thing on the back. And take it away. Oh, sure thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, David. Um, and thank you all for being here and especially to my two students for uh, nominating me. I'm gonna save you from slides right now because for whatever reason, this award made me feel like um, just kind of speaking from the heart. So I'm just gonna follow a few notes I put here for myself. Um, but I'm just, first of all, truly humbled up from this award. I think mentorship of students is such an important part of my job and it's, something that I'm constantly learning how to do better. And I don't feel like I've nailed it yet, but, but I guess these two students think I'm doing a pretty good job. And so that feels really good. Um, so I was reviewing what they had said about me and um, to kind of help answer this question, what are some of the keys to effective mentoring? And so when thinking about that, I thought, well, what do my students think I'm doing well? <laughs> Um, and so looking at the, what they said about me kind of, you know, also spoke to me about what I think is important in mentoring. And I think the first thing is to be really passionate about what you're doing. Um, and in my work, I'm really passionate about solving energy and climate problems. And I'm really passionate about working with people to do that. I'm really passionate about um, when people see a problem and they want to do something about it, helping to support them in doing that and helping them to actually achieve change rather than, you know, coming up against roadblocks again and again. So the work I do uh, most recently really focuses on how are people in their own lives taking action on climate and energy collectively. Um, and I talk about this kind of as local energy uh, organizations or committees or groups uh, but energy has so many different aspects to it. I tend to focus on two major areas of that energy efficiency and um, community solar, but there are a lot of other ways that you can take action um, for energy solutions. But in this particular context, one of my students that wrote this nomination for me is working on this um, project that I'm really excited about that is funded by the Mitchell Center. So thank you for that. Um, where we built window inserts in this room. And I realized I should have brought my mini insert so you could see it. But if you just picture a pine frame, you know, wood frame wrapped in clear plastic and lined with weather stripping that just goes inside the window, uh, that's what we're talking about. And the window insert build is really fun. I, I love building things, especially things that are actually helping to do good rather than just take up resources and energy. <laughs> um, and these inserts are designed to help save energy. So um, I find them really fun to make. And we had planned to do this project on Indian Island um, for Penobscot Nation citizens, but we ended up having to switch gears because COVID you know, had a resurgence. We were doing this in September and the island shut down. And I was working with a fantastic Penobscot Nation citizen, Chantel Neptune, um, who was a student here, here at UMaine a couple of years ago. Um, and she was really leading this project and I was helping to support her and mentor her in this. Um, so we ended up doing that window insert building workshop right here in this room, um, building 113 um, inserts for 12 Penobscot Nation citizens. So you can just picture this whole room filled with uh, kind of a woodworking type of situation and plastic and, and people just putting things together who've never done this before. So anyway, I could go on and on about how passionate I am about this, but I'm passionate about the, the research, the work, um, and then also about the mentoring, getting students involved in this and really helping them to see, you know, why this is important and how we really can make a difference um, with working with local communities and local people. Um, a couple of other things about keys to effective mentoring, being patient and remembering. Um, I spent most of my 20s, I think kind of in some ways searching for a mentor that I never found. <laughs> um, and so 
I did find mentors later in life in my thirties and my forties, but I think it was, it, it would have been really neat to have a mentor in my twenties. Um, and I think when I was an undergraduate, I just felt like I was so all over the place that I didn't even know what I needed from a mentor to go and look for it. And so when I'm mentoring students, I try to remember that feeling and remember and try to think about what would I have needed then? And a lot of that, you know, is, is patience, is being open and flexible, showing students that it's okay to ask whatever they need to ask, even if it seems stupid to them, um, showing them that we all make mistakes, learning together and creating something together um, and being open about what you know and what you don't know. And then um, those who know me also know I'm a little bit finicky about organization. So I have... <laughs> task lists that I share with my uh, men mentees to keep us on track and, and share shared tasks. We use Google Docs and Google Sheets. So I love the technology that can help us stay organized. Um, so moving on, because I know we're almost out of time. Um, how is my work making a difference? So as uh, David said, I had two students from two different projects um, nominate me for this. And so for the one of the projects is actually um, kind of localized to the Mitchell Center, looking at ways that we can more effectively network within the Mitchell Center and, and with people outside of the Mitchell Center to address sustainability solutions. Um, and then the second one is the one uh, working with Penobscot Nation and doing the window insert build. And the, the main kind of larger uh, vision for that project is to really understand um, how Penobscot Nation citizens think about alternative energy, what they want out of alternative energy, have they experienced um, energy injustice, and what are they, what are their thoughts on, on addressing that, um, and figuring out, you know, what is the solution that is coming from the community, and then we're doing that through some surveys, through some interviews. We did it through the workshop as kind of an, an immersion type of um, field experience. And the neat thing is that the student who wrote my nomination for this um, is Passamaquoddy. And so as part of her work, she's doing a side project where she's working on a lot of those things with the Passamaquoddy tribe. Um, so we're able to understand more about what two tribes in Maine are thinking about alternative energy and how these local energy solutions may be able to help. Um, so that's kind of, I hope how it's making a difference, but I feel like we're just biting off a tiny piece and that there's so much more to um, explore. But I will say with the window inserts, you know, the, we, we project that they, the 113 inserts that we built for 12 Penobscot Nation citizens will save a total around $2,000 a year or around $170 per year per person. Of course that you know, is based on them using them the way that they're intended and <laughs> a lot of other factors. Um, but that also saves, because they have different heating fuel types, around 320 gallons of oil per year, 361 therms of natural gas, and 115 gallons of kerosene per year, and about uh, um, eight tons of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions per year. So if we can, um, you know, continue that work and do more, then those numbers would go up. So um, how have I been changed by the experience of doing this work? Um, I am just on such an exciting and interesting path right now of, of trying to understand energy injustices and what the solutions are that are the most appropriate for the communities that are involved. And um, I feel like every day I'm learning something new about that. And I know that we're almost, we're at four, so I'm just gonna skip to the end, which is how can others join in this important work? Um, we do still have our Penobscot Nation survey open. So if there are some Penobscot Nation citizens here or listening that wanted to take part in that survey, I believe it's still up on the tribe website. Um, we are also doing some interviews of Penobscot Nation citizens. So if there are people who are jazzed about this project, and want to be involved, please contact me. And then we are also doing um, a Passamaquoddy survey coming up as well. So if we have Passamaquoddy uh, citizens who are interested in that, I would love to know. Um, and I'd love 
to be in a position to help mentor a project like this again next year. So um, I, if there are any Penobscot Nation citizens or Passamaquoddy or other Wabanaki uh, members who would like to you know, be involved in, in organizing a workshop like that or some other local energy event, I would love to be part of that. So thank you, that's all I got. <laughs> Sharon, and so if you didn't notice a little bit of passion there, you weren't paying attention. Um, and I would just say from students who are just beginning, even early in their undergraduate career, we have some to ones that have been at it, like Dominique, for two and a half years, to uh, faculty like Sharon and what they bring to this work and their commitment to working with students, to someone who was a student and has been out doing this for decades, this is really worth celebrating. It makes us feel special to have any connection to this and to support it where we can. We appreciate all you coming. And I know that many of you are involved in your own work like this. And I hope you find other ways to do it. And if we can ever work together, you know where to find us. So thanks everybody.